Welcome, everyone. I'm Lisa Schmucky, the founder of EdWeb, and it's my honor to introduce our presentation today with the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation. This is actually our 20th interview with recipients of the Medal of Honor, which has been such an honor for us to be able to host these interviews. And we're here with Kathy Metcalf, the Vice President of Education for the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation, and our honorary guest today, Robert Majewski, who has received the Medal of Honor for his service in the Marines in Vietnam. And we're also joined by Steel Canyon High School in California. So they're gonna be joining us and asking some questions of the recipient so that we can have more of a dialogue back and forth. Thank you all for coming. And we'd like to just start by taking a poll to see who is here. I know many of the teachers join with students in their class. So we pulled up a poll here and just click on the circle next to what level of school you're signing in from. And if you're a teacher here with your class, this is great. We'll just wait a few minutes so everybody gets a chance to tell us where they're coming from if they're there with their students. We actually have over 105 educators turn, joined in, so, and we love it when you come with your class. So actually looks like it's mostly high school, but also elementary and some middle school and other. Type in the chat if you're from a different, um, different school, type of school or if you have a different role in education. Librarian, preschool, wonderful, that is great. All right, I'm gonna close the poll. And Kathy, we're really looking forward to the interview with you and Robert Mujewski, so. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Steel Canyon. We wanna wave good morning. in. Good morning. Uh, we have uh, changed the process and and uh, format of these interviews over the years. We are, for the first time, not only piping in a high school, but Bob and I today are sitting in the classroom with the students. So we thank Steel Canyon for letting us be here today, and we're looking forward to a conversation with you. For our internet audience, I want to reiterate, as I always do on these webinars, the purpose of Medal of Honor Foundation conducting these webinars is as part of the Medal of Honor Society's character development program, we are looking to capture primary source material for our students to use. So these webinars today as a conversation with Medal of Honor recipient provide students an opportunity to get to know somebody that they wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to do. And we also record these webinars and archive them on our website and the EdWeb website. So. And if we go from a different location, last month it was archived also on the National World War II Museum web, uh, website. So that material is now out there for students to use when they're doing reports, research papers, and just for the general public to have that rich historical material that they wouldn't otherwise have. So as we take questions today, first and foremost, those of you who are sending in questions online, student questions are most important and we've got a lot of prepared questions here in the classroom, both that were sent in previously online and from these students, and then teacher questions, and then general public, if we can get to your questions, we will, but an hour goes really fast. So that being said, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. The students here have already seen your living history, so they know a little bit and they know about your Medal of Honor um, action. I would encourage our online audience, if you have not done so, watch Bob Mojeski's Living History and read his citation online. I know you can't do that right at this moment while you're watching that, but if you have not done so, go back and read that for the details because our focus today is on what makes a Medal of Honor recipient and what are the characteristics that we see embodied in the Medal of Honor, not necessarily what specifically happened on the battlefield. Okay, and to that end, somebody wrote in ahead of time, one of the first questions we got was, is this appropriate for a third grade audience? I saw a lot of elementary schools out there. Um, it, we're, I think that there will not be anything here that will not be appropriate for a, a third grade audience. If your eighth graders can sit still for an hour, I wanna hear about it afterwards, so yay. Um, let's get started. Um, we, we're gonna have the students here ask some questions about your time growing up in Wisconsin. Would you go ahead and start? Hi. Hi, I'm Jalen, and my question for you today is, what is the greatest lesson your parents taught you as a child? 
my greatest lesson uh, I taught uh, as a child uh, growing up in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was that um, my parents tried to teach me uh, to always be fair, to be honest, and to do the right thing, uh, which isn't always easy when you were uh, a child growing up, but nevertheless, those were some of the, the uh, thoughts that were uh, exposed to me uh, as I was growing up. Uh, my father uh, and mother came over from Poland at the, about the turn of the century. So uh, uh, our work ethic and our family and uh, uh, was, uh, was such that uh, these were very important attributes as far as uh, my growing up. That, uh, uh, you do the best job that you possibly can, whether or not you're in school or you're in some sort of other employment. So uh, that was probably the most uh, important uh, lesson that I learned. But always to treat people as you would like to be treated and to treat people fairly. Did you have brothers and sisters? I had three sisters, or I, uh, one of which is still uh, living, and I had one brother. Uh, and uh, of course, my parents uh, obviously are, are deceased, but uh, we all grew up as a big family in Milwaukee and uh, uh, very, uh, very loving family, very caring family. So uh, I was very fortunate to have the parents and the, uh, the siblings that I had. I think I saw that your nephew, Kevin, has logged on for the webinar today and also sent an announcement to, is it Pulaski High School you graduated Pulaski from? Pulaski High School, yes. So a shout out to Pulaski High School. I hope you were able to join us. Can we go for another question? Um, Billy, and you mentioned in your video that your family ate around the table and that was good for you. Why do you feel that way? Um, we ate around the table and uh, what was the other part? Why and was why that good for that you? Well, <clears throat> It was good because uh, around the table uh, at, at dinner time, and, and dinner time was really difficult for me because I played a lot of sports in high school. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we, uh, even though my father worked and uh, my mother didn't, why we did sit around the table. And uh, this was a discussion of uh, what happened during the course of the day in, in school. And uh, how we were doing in sports, how the school was doing in sports. So uh, it was a, a means of, uh, of communications and finding out what the family had done that particular day. What sports did you play? Played football, I played basketball, and I played baseball. I was a 118-pound uh, quarterback. I played uh, forward on the uh, basketball team, and I played uh, third base on the baseball team. Uh, which uh, in, in all the sports, uh, I was never going to be a superstar. I was never going to go to the NFL uh, or any, play any of those college sports. But uh, at that time in the, in the 1950s, when you were in high school, everybody was much smaller uh, than they are uh, today. Uh, you know, this student that was just here who played football for your high school, uh, uh, that was unheard of when I played. So, uh, uh, in fact, as I, as I was watching him, uh, he kind of frightened me a little bit when I mentioned uh, football, because uh, it'd probably break every bone in my body if I played today. <laughs> Great answer. Thank you. We have another question. Um, my name's Cameron. Uh, would you consider yourself to be a troublemaker when you're younger, or were you like a by the book? Were you a troublemaker when you were a kid or were you a by the book uh, student? No, I was uh, pretty much by the book. Uh, my parents didn't have too much problem with me. Um, first of all, my dad was, uh, you know, a discipline, I won't say a disciplinarian, but uh, discipline was a big thing in his, uh, in his life growing up in, in a foreign country, obviously. And uh, so he, uh, he projected uh, that discipline uh, toward me and uh, wouldn't uh, tolerate too much nonsense. Uh, in fact, I can remember one day at the dinner table, I, I was eating my dinner and uh, I had a comic book on the table uh, while I was eating. And, uh, you know, that did not go over well because I got whacked on the side of the head with that comic book. 
uh, well, the whole family was around eating and talking. So uh, that was a lesson well learned. I never did that again. Uh huh. I, some of us were raised with the, uh, in the old days, we were more afraid of getting in trouble at home than we were at school. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And if we got in trouble at school, it would have been trouble at home. So. Yeah. And besides, I like school. In fact, I can't ever remember missing a day in school. And uh, if I had to start all over again, why, uh, I'd be glad to, uh, to join all of you here at your school, believe it or not. That's great. Also, you know, you probably had to behave in school to remain eligible to play sports. You did. You had to have uh, at least a 2.0 um, grade point average and uh, mind your P's and Q's. So, uh, yeah, you had to uh, behave yourself. If you got into any trouble, you weren't going to stay with the team very long. Great, great question. Great answer. We have another question. Uh, my name is Liam. Uh, who were your heroes or the people that you looked up to? Uh, while growing up and who are your heroes now so who were your heroes while you were growing up and who are your heroes now well <clears throat> my heroes uh, certainly were uh, my parents because uh, of their uh, values as as a family and as parents and how they brought up my sisters and my brother and myself so they were probably my my number one uh, heroes um i had uh three brothers-in-law who were in the military uh, who served in uh, not only World War II, uh, but uh, one was at the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. And uh, so they, my brother-in-laws, uh, as far as their military service, were, were very instrumental in my bringing up. Uh, however, my family, uh, my father was not in the military and uh, as I was growing up, I really did not have much interest in the military. So, um, but uh, today, uh, my heroes, uh, uh, I like the Packers. <laughs> uh, although they, they've fallen on hard times. And uh, uh, of course, the University of Wisconsin, which is the school that I attended, uh, I've also fallen on hard times as far as their sports teams are concerned. But uh, uh, Nevertheless, uh, I respect uh, all people in the military for the job that they've done over the last 15, 20 years. So let's, um, and I'll continue to welcome questions about, about growing up in childhood and certainly about values, but let's move on a little bit to the military. I know the question's gonna come up. You, you joined the Marine Corps, you weren't drafted, right? And why did you choose the Marine Corps as opposed to one of the other branches? Well, when I was um, when I was at the University of Wisconsin, um, I was going to be a school teacher, upper elementary school teacher, and at Wisconsin at that time, you had to take two years of our compulsory ROTC. I have to tell you, I disliked every second that I was in <laughs> ROTC. And then, as you got to be a, a junior and a senior, you had to do some student teaching. And one day. Um, the teacher uh, at a school that I was doing my student teaching uh, asked me to teach a class on uh, vibration. So I had the kids take out their 12 inch wooden ruler, put it on the desk, uh, let half of it go over the, the edge of the desk and hold the other half down with their hand. And then uh, I said, well, take your right hand and then just kind of bend the ruler and let it bounce up and you can feel the vibrations. Well, you can imagine what happened, uh, you know, for third graders, sword fights, uh, people whacking one another with these rulers, the rulers were breaking and so on. And uh, so I went back to collecting papers and sharpening pencils during the, about the next month of my student teaching. And then uh, one day, uh, about a month later, the uh, teacher asked me to teach a class on music. Well, this was a simple, I think about a three bar song and I can't even sing in the shower. So uh, let alone, uh, you know, teaching kids a song. So uh, at that point, I kind of discovered that I was never going to be a very good elementary school teacher. And then one day I saw this Marine recruiter walking around on campus. And uh, so I decided, well, as a lark, I'll just go down and talk with him and see what he has to say. So after um, a 
uh, talking with them. And after graduation, uh, about the next month, I went into the uh, Marine Corps on active duty and uh, stayed there for the next 30 years. Uh, one thing I didn't uh, count on, however, was uh, about nine years later, laying in a ditch about a couple hundred meters from uh, North Vietnam. But uh, you always have to expect the unexpected. Wow, that what a transition! Yes, <laughs> from flying rulers in a classroom yes. to a ditch in Vietnam. Oh my goodness! All right, well, this kind of opens this up for any questions regarding Marine Corps years, Vietnam. Who's got a question related to these things? Somebody. While you were deployed in Vietnam, what were the things that you missed most about back home? Oh, good question. It is a good question. Uh, well, <laughs> certainly the thing that you think about most is your family back home. Um, and uh, you know, being in that kind of a situation, uh, your relationships, not only with your family, but with friends and uh, loved ones. And uh, you miss things such as uh, school. Uh, you miss things such as um, uh, television, uh, such as radio uh, programs. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, uh, that you miss, but it's just, uh, the distance between the United States and, and, for example, Vietnam, which is thousands upon thousands of miles, um, you know, it's, it's just a, kind of a lonely feeling, but uh, just something that if you're in the military, you're going to have to get used to. Did your Medal of Honor action happen on your first tour of duty in Vietnam? Yes, I was in Vietnam. Uh, for about four months before uh, an operation um, that uh, we uh, took part in, uh, which was uh, right up near the uh, demilitarized zone between the North and the South Viet, uh, countries of South Vietnam. And um, so it was a very short period of time before I got acclimated to, to Vietnam and, and the environment there because it is so hot that you're constantly wet. And uh, it takes about uh, four to six weeks to become acclimated to that type of a climate, uh, particularly if you come from a colder climate here in the United States. Uh, so um, uh, it's, it's the wetness, it's the humidity, it's, it's always 100% uh, humidity practically, and the temperature is always around 100 or, or even over. So. Uh, you're always fighting the environment. Uh, it's always either too hot in war, or it's too cold in war, or it's too far away, or it's it's too close. So there's all these other things that are on the periphery that make it a little bit more difficult than the actual fighting. Now, un unlike many of our soldiers who were drafted and sent overseas rather quickly, you had been in the Corps for, what, nine years before you went overseas? Yes, I went in the Marine Corps in 1957 and then uh, was in Vietnam in 1966 and, and 1967. Uh, so I was a, much older than, than the 18 or 19 year old uh, Marine or soldier or sailor or airman that. Uh, you found in Vietnam at that particular time. So, do you think that your the training that you had had during all those years in the Corps uh, played a part in your ability to both survive and to stay in control and under command in that time? Absolutely. Uh, I think if you'll find that if you talk to any of the services, that the training that that they've gotten uh, not only when they're in recruit training or basic training. Uh, before they ever get into a war situation is extremely helpful. And, uh, but the thing I want to emphasize here is that uh, somebody who is 17 in some cases and 18 in some cases, 19 and 20, are just absolutely amazing when it comes to a wartime environment. Uh, the only reason that I'm here today is because of, of uh, the privates and privates first class and corporals and sergeants that were with me in Vietnam. So in essence, I had a lot of time and a lot of help in getting this, this medal. So I, I really kind of wear it for those uh, men that I had and, and Navy corpsmen 
that I had in, in Vietnam. They were the ones that really got, uh, got this uh, for me. So I wear it for them. Thank you. Another question? My name is Lala. And what was it like emotionally and physically the day you received the Medal of Honor? Um, what was it like emotionally and the, the day you received the day I it? I received the, the Medal of Honor. I received it from President Johnson in 1968. And uh, President Johnson uh, is, is a guy who's about six feet four and uh, weighs about 200 pounds. And of course, at that time, uh, and, and not even now, I'm five feet eight. So I was always looking up at, uh, at the president. But uh, the environment is, is somewhat kind of like being in the fog. You really don't know why, why you're there. And uh, it's, it's some, somewhat surreal that, uh, you know, you're, you're there in front of all of these people. It's the president, it's the vice president, and, and uh, all your relatives and, and your friends and, and the military people that you served with in Vietnam are all there. So uh, it's, uh, it's a tremendous experience, but still a little bit foggy at the time. Not an experience very many people have. Yes, that's okay. right. Good question. May we have another question? Yes. I have one uh, bring it back a little. Um, I was wondering, what was it like to uh, call in air support um, on yourself and the people around you? How did you feel uh, emotionally about that? Prior to actually doing that, uh, I got some of my <clears throat> uh, senior uh, Marines together and told them, look, we're in a situation here now where we're either going to be captured or we're going to be killed. Uh, so we don't have very many options here. So uh, we're about ready to be overrun by overwhelming force of about 1,000 against 100. Uh, so our only alternative was to call in uh, artillery and uh, air support almost on top of us uh, to stop the enemy from, from overtaking our position. And so uh, uh, it came very close to um, where my Marines were. Um, some of them uh, got hit uh, with uh, some artillery rounds, uh, some shrapnel, uh, some napalm that was dropped by aircraft, uh, uh, burned uh, some of the Marines that were with me. And um, so uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I wasn't too popular when I made that decision to, to do that. But uh, nevertheless, you just have to do what, what uh, you have to do uh, when the situation uh, presents itself. But no one was captured. No one was captured. Uh, I did have, uh, over the course of four days, I had... Uh, uh, a number of Marines killed and, and, and a large number of Marines that were, were wounded. Uh, but uh, most of us uh, survived due to the corpsmen, the Navy corpsmen that we had that are right there at the battlefield. So they were able to administer uh, some preliminary medical uh, services here before they become evacuated. So. Uh, a lot of us owe our lives to the Navy corpsmen. And then probably in turn, once you got through that, that firefight, then the helicopters that were able to evacuate the wounded? Uh, helicopters um, uh, were not able to evacuate the wounded at the location that we were at when we had this, this battle against the uh, right. North Vietnamese Army. So <clears throat> when, we, when it was time for the operation to uh, cease, and we had to carry out all the Marines that were dead and all the walking wounded that I had to an area where helicopters could get in. The area in Vietnam that I was with was mountainous jungle. So it was almost impossible to land a helicopter or to have vehicles. So you had to walk everywhere that uh, you operated in. It goes back to that earlier comment that you made about not just fighting an enemy, but also fighting with the geography it's, and the, exactly. the climate. We have another question. Hi, my name is Maddie, and my question is, why did you and other recipients of the medal feel that character education is so important right now? Well, first of all, we feel it's so, edu uh, it's so education is so important because 
it gives you more options as to what you're going to do with your life. Um, for example, if you uh, if you associate with people that are are not positive, uh, who are not good role models, uh, that reduces your options when you apply for a job, when you apply to a college, uh, and, and try to improve on, on your education. Uh, for example, I was stationed at the Naval Academy after I got back from Vietnam, and in order uh, for someone to enter into the Naval Academy, just having a 4.0 grade point average is not going to be enough. Uh, you're going to have to uh, be a class president or a class uh, uh, officer of some sort, maybe a treasurer. Uh, they're going to look for people who do volunteer work. They're going to look for people who uh, have gone out into the community, maybe gone to hospitals, uh, uh, helping the elderly. Uh, so those extracurricular are, are things that have a big role in whether or not you get selected for the college that you want to go to. Uh, I think uh, the service academies, uh, when they uh, uh, solicit uh, about 1,100 students, uh, they probably have to ent uh, interview 15,000 before they pick the 11, 1,200. So, uh, you know, it's very, very important for education. Plus, uh, what do you want to do after your education is also important. The more education you have, the more options you're going to have as to what career you want to follow. Great question and great answer. Thank you. Uh, notice the emphasis there on service academies. And if you take the Medal of Honor, the the character values that the character development program features, th those are the values that the Medal of Honor recipients themselves selected. Commitment, courage, sacrifice, and integrity, and citizenship and patriotism. And when you put those things into action, that's where you have service. So. Great, thank you very much. Do we have uh, another yes. question? Hi. Thank you. Again, um, when you got home, how did people react when you mentioned that you fought in Vietnam? When I first got uh, back from Vietnam in 1967, uh, there was a very hostile environment back here in the United States. And um, in uh, several instances, uh, when I was on some various uh, radio shows, for example, uh, some of the questions were uh, uh, not not even questions. Uh, some of the comments that were made were were baby killer and uh, why are you there to begin with? Uh, those people did nothing to you, and uh, so it was a very uh, uh, very hostile situation. And it wasn't so bad for me because I was already a little bit older. I was a, a career officer, but somebody who was 18 or 19 years old that just spent a year over in Vietnam and he came back and he didn't have a parade. He wasn't recognized. Uh, people didn't like anyone that was in uniform. So uh, it was a very hostile uh, environment, uh, which I think has since been made up here since we've been in a war on terrorism. Did remaining in the core perhaps insulate you a little from the general public's attitude? Uh, yeah, I think so, yes. I think, uh, you know, if you stayed in the military, uh, uh, you know, you were, you were kind of shielded a little bit. So, um, uh, and besides, uh, you know, uh, you, you couldn't dwell on it too much. Uh, you know, you're, you're in the military, you got a job to do, and and you want to make sure you do that. So that, that takes the priority. And uh, After a, a certain period of time, the, the, the negative comments about Vietnam kind of died down a little bit. Thank you. Good, good question. Important question in the overall context of the war. And, and of course, one other thing, too, is, is that the, um, uh, the educational environment had a big role in, in bringing the war to the end, as you know. That uh, the colleges, particularly uh, many of them, particularly the eastern ones, were uh, adamantly opposed to uh, to the war and wanted it end with demonstrations and so on and so forth. So, uh, college uh, students and probably high school students as well played a big role in 
in bringing that war to a conclusion. Yes, sir. Hi, so my name is Jared. I'm asking for uh, Deer Valley High School. Uh, if you could go back to being a teenager, what advice would you give yourself? Uh, first of all, I wouldn't mind going back to school being a teenager. Let me, uh, <laughs> let me uh, point that out. Uh, but uh, I would say uh, to study and study and study. Uh, I was lazy. Unfortunately, I was lazy when I was in high school. I could have done, I think, much better than, uh, than I did. But uh, sometimes uh, some extracurricular things get in the way. Sometimes sports get in the way from, from your academic work. Uh, so uh, I think I would spend much more time uh, studying than I did um, in high school. And uh, I didn't do much studying uh, in college uh, as much as I should have also. Uh, you know, you spend a lot of time in the student union, uh, uh, lunchtime playing cards, cutting classes. And uh, as I look back, uh, if I had to start all over again, I, I certainly wouldn't do that. I'd, uh, I'd put my nose to the books a little bit uh, more so than I did. But didn't you graduate though in three years from college? No, I graduated in four years. Four years? Yeah. Was it four years? Four years. And yeah. then went into the service. And then went into the service, yes. Uh, which I think probably in today, uh, graduating four years of college is uh, somewhat difficult. It's mm -hmm. almost five years, I think, today. Especially with some some majors, you can't actually complete all the coursework if you're going to be. That's those right. of you who are headed to be engineers, plan on five. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's a changing landscape. Do we have another question? I'm Paula. Um, Michelle. A little Peterson. louder, Paula. My name is Paula, and Michelle Peterson wants to know what do you think is the toughest character trait to uphold? Oh, what is the toughest character trait to uphold? I think the toughest character trait to uphold is being honest. Uh, I think um, being honest, uh, having integrity. Uh, you know, with uh, there's so many, um, you're being pulled in so many directions uh, in today's environment. I think uh, with with technology, with students, and uh, I think uh, being honest and, and uh, uh, integrity, uh, the kind of person you are, uh, the role model that uh, you are. I think these are the most important uh, characteristics uh, that I can think of. Uh, treating people, treating people fairly. Um, sometimes there's a tendency to um, treat someone a little bit different for maybe the same offense than you would because you know that person versus a person you don't know. Uh, so uh, I think uh, those are the uh, the traits that I think are important. Good question. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that from, that was one of the questions that has come in off the, off the internet. So um, as someone pointed out on our, on our internet chat, doing the right thing, even when nobody is looking. So maybe we have another question. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, hi, my name is Brad. And I was wondering, was there an incident when you arrived to Vietnam that kind of just was like, oh, like I'm in war? Um. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, the minute you arrive in Vietnam, uh, the plane lands and then the, uh, you get off the plane and it's like a blast furnace that hits you right in the face. It is so hot, so humid uh, that uh, that's, that's the first thing that you encounter. And this is why it takes you five or six weeks to get acclimated. Uh, but I think uh, the first operation that you go on because you're you're new. Uh, the Vietnam War was the first war that I was ever involved with. So uh, the first uh, first time uh, that you engage an enemy, first time you hear a gunshot, uh, the first time you hear an explosion, uh, those are things that uh, wake you up to say, well, you know, this is a little bit different environment than I'm than I'm cus uh, accustomed to. So. Um, uh, but once you get over that initial uh, apprehension uh, and uh, that anxiety, uh, things kind of smooth out and, 
and you rely on the people that you've surrounded yourself with. So um, it's, it's something that uh, you're never going to get used to, uh, but it's something that, um, you know, if you're going to be in the military, it's something that you're going to have to deal with. Probably best that we never get used to that. Never get used to it is, is absolutely right. Uh, one war is, is more than anyone needs. And just for the record, by the way, some of our Viet, uh, some of the Medal of Honor recipients were actually uh, involved in up to three different wars. Joe Jackson, who received his medal for actions in Vietnam, also fought in World War II and in Korea. So it's, uh, you know, those of you who were in the career military often saw ongoing uh, conflicts. We have another question. Hi, I'm Sophia. What have you found to be the most rewarding part about wearing the Medal of Honor? Oh, good question. What's most yes, rewarding about that? Excellent, medal? Yes, uh, what's the, uh, the nicest thing about having received this Medal of Honor is, is certainly uh, is the people that you meet, that you meet um, getting uh, invited to high schools such as this and talking to young people such as yourselves here. And uh, uh, you get to meet a lot of different people, a lot of politicians. You get to meet a lot of uh, actors, Hollywood actors. Uh, you get to uh, go to uh, some great functions. Uh, you get uh, to go to the White House, obviously. Uh, and in some cases on more than one occasion, uh, because a lot of times, I won't say a lot of times, but uh, a number of times you get invited back to the White House, you, maybe for a reception. Uh, you get to meet uh, different presidents. Um, for example, uh, if you talk about actors, uh, I've met uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, I've met, um, uh, Oh, a, a number of others uh, that uh, play in movies and, and musicians. So, uh, you know, it, it's very rewarding in that regard. But uh, the other thing is that uh, you see how many generous people there are in this country um, who are willing to, to sacrifice their time and their, their energy and their money uh, to have us come to their, their cities and, and have a convention or have a fundraiser for, for a number of charities and so forth. So uh, there's a lot of rewards, no negative uh, aspects of it, only rewards. Good, good question. So do you have a particular favorite of some of the events that you've been to? Yeah, well, uh, you yeah, know, we have a convention every year in which all of the Living Medal of Honor recipients are invited to. So we go to different cities throughout the uh, to U.S. So it's always a time to renew old acquaintances and, and meet new people and and uh, different uh, be invited to different sections of the country. So uh, it's an education process for us as well as anyone else. I think. Did you go to the Green Bay, Wisconsin went to uh, Went to the Green Bay Packer uh, uh, convention, not Packer, but uh, Green City of Green Bay, uh, uh, convention and uh, got invited down on the field for the coin toss with these uh, gigantic football players that are 300 pounds or more and, and, and six feet two and three and four and uh, so uh, it's a very uh, very moving experience and uh, it's nice to be able to do that. And did you have a favorite inauguration that you went to? Medal of Honor recipients are invited to presidential inaugurations too. Yes, we uh, we go uh, get invited to all the inaugurations. Uh, although it's uh, somewhat difficult to go back to Washington D.C. Uh, when you're coming from San Diego and California. <laughs> Why do they do in, that in January? <laughs> in, Jan in January, so uh, you know it's. Uh, but nevertheless, they're very very interesting and they're educational. Besides, okay. Do we have another question here? Yes, sir. My name is Robert, and my question is, what do you think the greatest challenges our generation faces? Well, certainly the greatest challenges that, that you have now are, are, I think, probably are with technology and all the technology that's going on. It, it almost seems like uh, once you uh, 
you learn to operate your uh, your iPhone and your cell phone while uh, you have to come up now with a driving a vehicle that doesn't really have a driver, but that drives by itself. So I think uh, that's certainly a, a challenge, all the technologies. And, and I think we're going to have a big problem with uh, cyber security, uh, not only uh, from places like Russia, or places from China, but uh, maybe some of these third world, third world countries as well. So I think um, uh, cybersecurity, uh, the war on terrorism is, is going to be a challenge for, for everyone. I think that's going to go on for a long, long time, uh, probably with never knowing what the final result will be. Uh, if, if there is a final result, it'll be something like it, well, it just kind of faded away. So uh, those are all going to be challenges. So, and I think uh, uh, financial challenges, uh, I think, are always going to be a problem, obviously. Uh, the population is getting older, uh, so it's going to require more uh, services for, for elderly. So uh, you're going to be faced with a lot of things. But uh, from looking at your faces, uh, I think the challenges are going to be met here, uh, right here in this classroom. So. Great, great question and wonderful answer. Yes, ma'am, would you? Hi, I'm Andy, and my question is, when you were in Vietnam, was there anything that you did with your troops that reminded you of home? Uh, That's a fun question. Yeah. I guess that would be during downtime. Yeah, which, which but there was very little. Uh, I spent almost all of my time uh, in Vietnam, uh, up uh, right near North Vietnam, and and in a jungle, so uh, you know there were uh, no women, uh, there were no uh, no television, uh, no radios. Uh, it was uh, mostly uh, just a lot of work. And when you did have some downtime, uh, what you did is you, you went back to your base camp and you did some some training. Uh, so uh, you know you didn't sit around watching television or. or uh, listening to a radio or, or that type of thing. You, you spent your time uh, taking care of yourself and writing letters. And um, unfortunately, uh, uh, one of the uh, jobs that's required of a, of a commander in, in Vietnam is that if you get someone who uh, gets killed, then you have to write letters to the parents. And that's probably the most difficult uh, thing that, that uh, you can do uh, when you have your downtime in a wartime situation. I have a question that piggybacks on that. Um, my dad was in, and his brothers were all in World War II, and their mom got letters, the kind that you're talking about, but they all came from a chaplain. They didn't come from a commanding officer mm -hmm. as a rule. Did you have a chaplain that helped you with those uh, duties? Not necessarily a, a chaplain, but... Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, it doesn't have to be a long letter. It can be a very short note that uh, how well your son uh, did or daughter today uh, did in a combat situation, uh, how much he meant to the unit. Uh, he was a, a good Marine, a good sailor, a, a good Air Forceman, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, anything uh, elaborate. It's just a uh, you know, if you write a simple handwritten note to a parent uh, or a survivor of someone who's been deceased, uh, that, that really kind of goes a long way. Rather than a form letter that someone puts in a typewriter or texts and you sign your name and, and uh, send it on off. So uh, the more personal you can be when you write a letter such as that, uh, it's really something that's going to be... Uh, more important to the parent or, or the husband or the, or the, or the wife uh, than some typewritten uh, item. That's, that's an important comment for all of you to think about in a day when we rely so heavily on texts and emails that evaporate once we hit delete that a, a handwritten note can make a, a huge difference. Good question. Do we have another question here? Hi, I'm Zachary. I'm from Virginia. I want to know if you were any of your calls or cheers. Uh, 
first of all, speaking for myself, I don't think I experienced uh, the PTS, uh, uh, PTSD that uh, you see uh, <clears throat> today. Uh, however, I think uh, that particular situation uh, has taken place in every war that this country has ever ever fought. Although it wasn't called PTSD back in World War One or, or back in the Civil War, I think this was a term that developed uh, out of the Vietnam War, probably more so than, than anywhere else. I think <clears throat> in uh, World War Two, if you were to use that term, they probably would have called it a, a Section Eight or something similar to that. Uh, but uh, there are a number, in fact, a number of my friends uh, uh, had P PTSD. Um, I think in, in my case, uh, where uh, I was a little bit older and uh, I, was, I was the commander. So uh, as a commander, I probably had the easiest job that you could have when you, in a wartime situation. I'm being a little bit facetious here when I say that, but uh, the hard job goes to those that are armed with a rifle and uh, or some other type of weapon, some private or some some private first class. He's he's really the the, the tip of the spear, so to speak. Uh, but for myself, uh, I didn't. I don't think I've experienced it, but I've seen people who have, and uh, it takes a it takes a while to get over, if ever. Good, good question. We have another question. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, another recipient of the Medal of Honor once said that it was easier. To, sorry, it was easier to earn the Medal of Honor than it was to wear it. What do you think he meant by that? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> once you receive uh, an award such as this, I think uh, your responsibilities uh, are increased. Uh, for example. Um, uh, first of all, you don't want to do anything that dishonors uh, your medal. Uh, you don't want to do anything that brings uh, discredit upon the service, in my case being in the Marine Corps uh, or any other service. Uh, and uh, so I think more is expected from you as a role model and how you conduct yourself. Uh, you know, the integrity things comes back into play. The honesty comes back into play the commitment, how you do things, how uh, other people see you and, and what you do. Uh, I think those are the things that uh, that are become very, very important. Uh, going out and speaking to groups such as all of you in, in, in high schools or, or middle schools and, and colleges and to offer advice and uh, uh, those are, are things that uh, I, I think is something that uh, we all don't do enough of, uh, but uh, you know, and, and you know, some people are happy, are, are, uh, are okay with that. Some people have find it a little bit difficult, uh, but uh, you know, it, it gets us to come out and talk in front of people. You know, which isn't always easy. It's uh, you know, it, it takes uh, uh, some work to get up in front of people and, and to do it and, and, and feel reasonably comfortable uh, with it and. Uh, Knowing what you're talking about is is uh, important. Uh, you know, if you try to come up uh, before an audience and, and you're unsure of what you're saying, or maybe it's not entirely 100% truthful, people recognize a phony right away. In the military, more so than anybody else. Uh, if you're a private and you're looking at at a lieutenant, for example, and you see that you know, his, his mannerisms or his, uh, the way he treats people is not fair or he's a phony, he's a braggart. Uh, they recognize that right away. And, and once you have that in an organization, you have a lot of trouble. Uh, let me mention for the audience overall, I'm sure that Mr. Robbins has, has told all of you this, but for our general audience, it's important to be aware that the Medal of Honor has only been awarded to just over 3,500 individuals in the entire history of this country since that medal was started at the beginning of the, of the Civil War. 
there are only today 74 Living Medal of Honor recipients. So uh, needless to say, with invitations like this and only uh, of the 74, maybe two thirds of you get around and do much traveling. There's great demand for them to be in places and to do things, but not a lot of opportunity. So this is an extremely uh, terrific opportunity, both for those of you in this room and for those who are online with us today. Uh, pretty rare, and thank you so much for doing that. This, I think it indicates a continued lifetime of service on behalf of our Medal of Honor recipients. And to tie it back into the question you asked, which was a very good question, because there are so few, as those of you who are in leadership roles know, that whether you're the captain of the team you're on or the student body president, the spotlight lands on you. And the guys in the back row can be goofing off and get away with it, but the person the spotlight's on can't get away with it. And that's very much what that medal does is that it draws the spotlight. Do we have another question here? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Dustin. Uh, what feelings or, me or memories are provoked when you put the medal around your neck? Well, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, you know, I, I don't wear this for myself. It doesn't belong to me. I'm not I'm not the owner, so I'm just kind of, uh, uh, in, in my particular case, uh, uh, one uh, 130th, uh, you know, the owner of this. So um, I think of uh, sacrifice when I when I wear this and, and, and put this on. Uh, I think of uh, uh, the uh, the people who are in Arlington National Cemetery or every national cemetery in the country, or uh, uh, state uh, cemeteries or even local cemeteries and the tremendous amount of sacrifice that this country has uh, given up its, its youth and all the wars that we fought, uh, uh, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, Vietnam, Korea, World War, uh, World Wars I and II, and just a tremendous, tremendous amount of sacrifice that, that uh, young people have made uh, for this country. So. Uh, this is uh, this is what I think about uh, when I when I wear this. I might add too that uh, if you notice on, on on this one here, there are three different types of uh, medals of honor. This one happens to be one that's issued to the Marines, Marine Corps, the Navy, and the Coast Guard. Uh, the Army has a little bit different one, uh, which you have you have one on, on the back on your your, your board back there. Um, and then uh, that's given uh, to the Army. And then the Air Force has one that is similar to the Army, only it's a little bit bigger. It's the same award, but it's got a different design that it, that reflects the branch of service. Yes. So good, good question. Do we have another question? We're just about out of time here. We have maybe two or three more questions before we have to wrap up. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Mary from Florida wants to know what your thoughts about the military vending now are. Oh, your thoughts about the military then and now. What do you think about, you know, maybe the major differences? Well, <clears throat> I think today's military um, is much smarter than uh, those that served in our previous wars, of, uh, our world wars, our Koreas, and, uh, and our, uh, our Vietnams. Um, I think they have to be. Uh, I know when I came into the Marine Corps, uh, the majority of, of uh, service people probably read at a sixth grade level. Uh, now, the problem is, is that the manuals that the military has are written at an eighth grade level. So if you can't read at an eighth grade level, you're going to have trouble understanding <clears throat> uh, the weapons that you're using in the military. And I know the services, when, when they had uh, enlistees who were not reading at the eighth grade level, there were remedial reading programs to bring them up to that level. So uh, uh, that program, I think, is still in effect today. But everyone is smarter today uh, with technology, uh, with uh, high school graduates uh, being predominantly in the military today versus what it was when you were only a 10th grader or 11th grader years ago. 
So everyone is either a college student or a high school graduate. Uh, so, and the technology that you've all been exposed to, uh, certainly uh, you're smarter and, and, and able to uh, uh, operate uh, in, in the military environment as it is today versus what it was uh, 20, 30 years ago. There was a time during Vietnam, particularly when students would sometimes say, well, if I can't get into college, I'll join the military. That is no longer a luxury that, that uh, failing students have, quite frankly. Not that not going to college means you're failing, but but you have to be able to meet a, some pretty solid standardized tests to get into the military these days. There are waiting lists for most of the of the branches of service at this point. So, uh, you know, the demands are much higher than they were, mm -hmm. much more elite force than we had. Yeah, and, and, and in spite of the marijuana thing that we have going across the country today, uh, the military is still uh, adamantly opposed to the, to the marijuana thing, and it's still against uh, the law, uh, the U.S. law, not, not necessarily the state law, but it's still against the law. Uh, or uh, for drugs, so uh, and the, the military is not going to tolerate drugs either. So, you know, if, if you think you can get away with being in California that has, <laughs> that has these liberal liberal uh, marijuana laws and then join the military, uh, I don't think so. So uh, keep that in mind. Yeah. So that right. bottom line there is that not only do you have to pass the academic test, you have to pass the drug test. Okay, we are down to about three minutes. Can we take one more question? Hi, um, receiving the medal means others thought you went above and beyond. Do you feel you did go above and beyond and why do you think others think that? I think if you talk to the 72 living Medal of Honor recipients, not one of them will ever say that they deserve this because uh, that's just not so. Uh, I think the probably stock answer that you're going to get is that we were just doing our jobs. Uh, you know, we were called to do a job. And we did it, and uh, you know it's a, as simple as that. Uh, it's unfortunately that there are so many, many more who deserve this uh, that never even get the recognition for the heroic actions in, in whatever war they were in, whatever service that they were in. So, uh, you know, I just find myself fortunate that I can represent a small part of, of that. And, but it's not something that I consider to be deserved because I certainly don't. Uh, when Bob says that so many weren't recognized, the requirement for the Medal of Honor is that at least two people be witnesses for that. Um, so if there were no witnesses left, then perhaps those medals were not, were not awarded. Um, we have only two minutes left and we have some business to take care of with our uh, with our EdWeb people. So we're going to sign off. But I want to say thank you so much to Steel Canyon and to all the other schools that were signed on out there. High Desert Middle School. Um, I saw schools from New York City, Massachusetts, all across the country. So thank you all for being with us today. And look for, um, we're taking December off, but we'll start up webinars again um, probably in January, definitely in February, March, and April for more Medal of Honor interviews. So I hope that you'll all be with us. And you guys did a great job today. Thank you to Steel Canyon. And thank you, Bob, for being here. You're welcome. You were a great audience. I appreciate it. Yeah. Lisa, you're on. Yes, thank you so much. I'm Lisa Schmucky, the founder of EdWeb, and that was just a wonderful interview. Thank you so much, Bob. I know after watching all the interviews um, with the recipients, I think your humility and the humility of your peers who wear the medal is, is so impressive in a time when that's such an important value. Uh, Steel Canyon High School, you were wonderful. You asked great questions. And Kathy, thank you so much for bringing these interviews to teachers and their students all around the country. So thank you all. And please, if you would like to um, get more of the resources and watch more of the interviews, you can join the Medal of Honor Foundation community on EdWeb at edweb.net slash CMOH. If you'd like to receive a certificate as a teacher who participated today, then um, you'll get an email with that information tomorrow. So thank you very much for coming.
And here's a little bit more information about the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation Character Education Program and a link to where you can go. And again, tomorrow you'll all receive an email with more information on that. And here is the link to the Medal of Honor Foundation community on EdWeb. And I think you would find these to be tremendous resources. Uh, someone mentioned in the chat where if you did, weren't able to come live with your students today, these recordings are really wonderful to share with your students at any time when it's more convenient for you. So I hope you will do that. So thank you very much. And we look forward to more interviews in 2019.